people in the community to have the opportunity to hear from Yossi Klein Halevi. And that is thanks to the very extraordinary work of Charles Small and Yisa, the uh, Yale Initiative for the Inter Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism. The briefest introduction, and um, I hope I won't be embarrassing Charles at all when I say that. Um, first of all, propitiously, um, this program is um, falls almost right before the holiday of Passover, and um, and although he has programs, my goodness, if any of you get his emails, um, you know it, it feels like every time I turn around, he has not only a program but an extraordinary program that we don't want to miss. So. Congratulations on that. But it occurred to me when Charles said, would I say a word, that um, as we prepare for Passover, in fact, this whole story, the story of our liberation, the story um, in the month of Nisan of, of miracles, of liberation, and certainly of hope, um, actually takes uh, begins in the first uh, section of Exodus when we hear um, the Pharaoh actually um, saying what may be the first recorded um, comments about anti-Semitism. And, and that is that the Jews in Egypt, or the Israelites in Egypt, are uh, multiplying uh, like animals, that they are taking up um, the space. They may perhaps be, and this will be reminiscent of things we've heard, they may be perhaps um, be a, a fifth column, who knows what um, arrangements they might find with other um, other peoples. They should have had Yisa back then, I guess, to answer some of those questions. Um, I don't know, I've known Charles since 2001, and uh, it was before he, um, he had dreamt the dream, but he hadn't made it into reality, of starting this, which is the first, and the only, and a permanent um, program based in America on the study of anti-Semitism. It is extraordinary. We are, of course, in New Haven. Very lucky to be uh, living uh, with the uh, Yale University, the Urim, the Tumim uh, amongst us, but it is particularly um, a, a grateful thing for the New Haven Jewish community, as well as the Yale community, to have Charles in our midst. Charles is extraordinary not only in the people that he has brought to this community and to Yale University, but also in his willingness to share the prodigious resource that is Giza. And, um, and I personally am grateful to him both for his friendship and for his um, talent and for his willingness to be a strategic partner. And uh, that's extraordinary. Some of you, uh, because Charles by his nature is a pretty modest folk fellow, uh, you may not even be aware of his own academic credentials, which are extraordinary. He is, of course, a writer. He is a speaker. Um, he's just come back from a conference in Berlin um, in which he's talked about Israel, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Holocaust denial in um, the world. And, uh, and he will be at Durban, too. Um, and we would expect him to be at Durban, too, because we need to hear his voice at Durban, too. Um, and that is something which all of us should um, look forward to hearing what he would have to say. And this summer he's been invited, um, as he's often invited in many places to speak at the Anthropoets. He'll be in New Zealand and in Australia and he'll be talking a national oratory about issues of anti-Semitism. So it is um, really a great pleasure for me to, um, to ask Charles to come forward. He will introduce the speaker, but I ask you on behalf of um, our community and all of the things that Charles does, to consider your own philanthropy and generosity to make sure that this program uh, continues and continues for a long time until, of course, there is no more anti-Semitism. <laughs> Thank you. So, Cindy, thank you very much, and uh, I moved actually from Jerusalem to New Haven, and I met Cindy uh, a few days after I arrived here. And I, 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 found... know, I waited that long? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I found the community actually very open and, uh, and kind, and it's been uh, an honor to be here, and it's an honor to be connected to the community, it's very important to remain connected to the community, um, especially, I would argue, during these times, and as Cindy rightfully said, as Pesach is arriving, we have to face the new pharaohs and, uh, and be aware of what they're saying, to understand their language, to understand their agendas. And I think also the story of Pesach is also about renewal and freedom and redemption. 
but I think we really have to confront and face and understand the minds of our enemies and what they're doing and uh, what the agenda is. So I urge you to, uh, to read some of the material that our, our illustrious guest uh, writes to access material in our archive, to look at websites like memory.org, and to really understand what we're facing as a community. And I think, as many of you know, and many of you are aware, that these are very auspicious times and we need to understand and come together to support Israel and uh, to support the diaspora communities that uh, face significant threats. And I think there's nobody better than uh, Yossi Klein Alevi. It's really an honor to have him here today. The title of this talk tonight is The Political and Religious Consequences Among Israelis of the New Antisemitism. As many of you know, Yossi Klein Halevi is a senior fellow at the Adelson Institute for Strategic Studies at the Shalem Center in Jerusalem. He's the Israeli correspondent and contributing editor of the New Republic. He's written widely and speaks widely. He's a columnist for Jerusalem Post. He's a scholar um, throughout the world on Middle Eastern affairs and strategic issues, and obviously on the threats uh, that we face today in the contemporary context. It's really an honor to have you, and, and thank you for coming. Good evening, and thank you, Charles. And thank you for all you do and the profound way that you do it. If in the 1990s someone had told me that I would be delivering a lecture on anti Semitism, in an institute devoted to studying contemporary forms of anti-Semitism, I quite simply would not have believed it. I was one of those Israelis in the 90s who believed that it was more or less over. It meaning the assault on Israel's legitimacy, the ghettoization of the Jewish state internationally, and I felt that those who were persisting in raising the issue of anti-Semitism were, quite frankly, being alarmist and were deflecting our attention from opportunities that were there to be, to be taken advantage of. And now, here we are, 2009, lecture on the new anti-Semitism. There are two forms of anti-Semitism. The first is unremarkable. It is the dislike or the hatred or the fear of the other. And in that sense, it is similar to the hatred or fear or dislike of any other. And here in the United States, when you track, for example, hate crimes, and that is interdenominational, non-discriminatory, under that rubric, you will have hate crimes against Muslims, Jews, other minority groups. And that represents the first kind of anti-Semitism. The second form of anti-Semitism is unique and potentially lethal. And that is what we may call the anti-Semitism of symbols. The anti-Semitism of symbols singles out the Jew as the representative of whatever a given society defines as its most detested quality or trait or moral offense. So, for example, under the old Christian theology, the Jew as Christ killer. Under medieval Islam, the Jew as murderer of prophets. Under Nazi Germany, the Jew as race polluter. Under the Soviet Union, the Jew as capitalist. And now, what is, to my mind, erroneously called the new anti-Semitism, Israel Zionism as the arch-offender, the violator of what our society deems its highest value, human rights. Israel as colonialist, the Jew as the great poisoner of the well of human rights. And I say that the new anti-Semitism is, to my mind, an inaccurate term because this is really just the latest incarnation of the old anti-Semitism 
of symbols, the old lethal anti-Semitism of symbols. Now, in my talk tonight, I'd like to explore the relationship between the growing demonization of Israel and Zionism and its impact on a hardening of Israeli political and also religious attitudes. The more isolated and demonized Israelis feel, the more that every Israeli act of war is turned into a war crime, the more right-wing Israelis turn, both in their politics and in their religious attitudes. There are, of course, other factors at play, Arab terrorism, the hatred from within the Arab world, the isolation of Israel within the Middle East, the sense of betrayal that so many Israelis feel toward much of the Arab world in relation to peace agreements. Nevertheless, I would not minimize the impact of international attitudes, the growing judgmentalness against Israel on the hardening of Israeli attitudes that we are witnessing today. And of course, the new government that just came into power yesterday with Avigdor Lieberman as the face, external face of Israel is an indication that we are increasingly on a collision course between the Israeli public and much of the international community. In fact, I would define it as a kind of poisonous cycle that we seem caught in, which is that the more Israelis feel under assault, under siege, the more Israeli attitudes harden, the more Israeli voters turn to politicians offering simplistic solutions like Avigdor Lieberman, and that in turn only seems to confirm the international judgment against Israel. Until 1967, the anti-Semitism of symbols directed against Zionism in Israel was almost completely confined to the Soviet Union and the Arab world. In Western Europe, attitudes were overwhelmingly pro-Israel. Cynics would say that that was a result of Holocaust guilt. I think that there was another factor at play, which was a widespread and genuine revulsion against the genocidal rhetoric that was routinely emerging from the Arab world. For example, in 1948, when Israel was, was founded, the then Secretary General of the Arab League, Azan Pasha, made a statement to the effect that the massacre that Arab armies were about to inflict on the Jews would, would make the massacres of Genghis Khan pale in comparison. And those, of course, were the years of the unbridled rhetoric of throwing the Jews into the sea. Ahmad Shukari, the founder of the PLO, the, the, the leader of the PLO before Arafat took over, uh, was a routine purveyor of the line of throwing the Jews into the sea. So that it was very difficult in the West to find sympathy for that kind of genocidal position. And I'll add parenthetically, we'll get to this point a bit later, that we are now, if anything, at a point in the conflict where genocidal rhetoric is even more pronounced against Israel. Yet, as we all know, much of the West has since developed a tolerance and ability to absorb the kind of genocidal rhetoric which in the 50s and 60s place the Arab cause largely beyond the pale in the West. The transformative moment, of course, was the 1967 Six-Day War, when, again, if one wants to be cynical, one can say that Israel survived too well, its victory was too convincing, and it unleashed the beginnings of this new form of the anti-Semitism of symbols in the West. The Israeli reaction to the growing condemnation, especially in the UN and in diplomatic circles immediately after the Six-Day War, was captured by the great Israeli satirist Ephraim Kishon in his article titled, Sorry We Won. And another symbol of that Israeli pushback to the condemnation against Israel following the victory 
was a, a cartoon that appeared in the Israeli press, and there was a famous symbol, a cartoon, a caricature known as Srulik, which is an endearment for the word Israel, Israel, who represented this, the embattled and spunky old Israel of pre-67. And the cartoon that showed Srulik just before the Six-Day War depicted Arab tanks surrounding this one little guy with a kova tembel, the old kibbutz floppy hat, and all the turrets are pointed at him and he's standing there defiant. The post-67 image of Srulik showed him again being surrounded by hostile figures, except this time they were diplomats pointing their finger at him. So that was the beginning of the psychological shift in terms of Israel's relations with the international community, in terms of beginning to realize that we have a problem. It did not get acute until the 1973 Yom Kippur War. The oil boycott, which galvanized um, the Arab world and put pressure especially on the third world, African countries, for example, under the economic pressure of the Arab world, began one by one to break off diplomatic relations with Israel. And there was a growing mood in the state of Israel of siege. So that Israelis in the immediate aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, which had been the most devastating war that Israel had fought since 1948, the mood was really of a combined double siege. On the one hand, the sense of augmented Arab military power and, uh, and economic power, and on the other hand, of growing diplomatic siege against the Jewish state. When Arafat was invited to the UN in 1974 to deliver his speech, don't forget this was the Arafat who did not even bother in those years to pay lip service, did not even pretend that he was recognizing the legitimacy of Israel. He was invited to the UN and received a standing ovation. And the response within the Israeli public was that the legitimacy or the right of Israel to exist was being rescinded by the international community. The growing sense of isolation in Israel strengthened an emerging new right-wing movement known as Gush Emunim, the Black of the Faithful, the religious messianic movement that promoted settlement building. It's telling to note that Gush Emunim was not founded after the messianic euphoria of the 1967 war, but only in the wake of the apocalyptic fears of the 1973 war. Gush Emunim, for all of its messianic vision, was primarily a response to the growing Israeli fear of destruction. Of it was intended as a response to the demoralization among Israelis, to what they called the defeatism that was growing among Israelis, but most of all to the growing apocalyptic fears among Israelis. Gush Emunim's greatest success, its moment of triumph, coincided, to my mind, not coincidentally, with the culminating moment in the 1970s of the international communities delegitimization of Israel and Zionism, and I'm referring, of course, to the Zionism Racism Resolution of November 10th, 1975, when a majority of nations met in solemn assembly and signaled out Zionism as the, in effect, the world's greatest contemporary offender uh, against human rights and all that is good. That was the moment that enshrined the latest stage of the anti-Semitism of symbols. Israel's ambassador to the UN, Chaim Herzog, later to become the president of Israel, in his well-known response at the UN podium, he, took, he ripped up the speech, some of you may recall that moment, noted that the UN vote coincided with the anniversary of Kristallnacht the 1938 pogrom that was the first mass violent attack against Jews in Germany. 
And Herzog proceeded to compare the UN Zionism Racism Resolution to the atmosphere of delegitimization against the Jews in Germany in the 1930s. And in that sense, he encapsulated the growing mood among Israelis that we were now back in the 1930s. The 1930s being the decade that preceded through words, through the language of delegitimization, and that laid the groundwork for the genocide of the 1940s. And Israelis coined at that point a term that was even a popular song with these words, the whole world is against us. The Gush Emunim response came three weeks later with a mass march into the Northern West Bank to demand that the first Rabin government that was in power then, the labor government, should open up the West Bank to unlimited Jewish settlement. This was, in fact, the eighth attempt that Gush Emonim <coughs> had launched to try to, to impose its will on the Israeli government. But this time, instead of several hundred or two or three thousand people squatting in the northern, in the West Bank, Gush Emonim drew thousands and thousands of demonstrators in large part in direct response to the Zionism Racism Resolution. It's extraordinary to go back and read the Israeli media accounts of that march. We've become accustomed to deep hostility in most of the Israeli media to the settlement movement. At that moment, with the exception of perhaps Haaretz, the Israeli media was overwhelmingly sympathetic this was a march that was led by Naomi Shemer, who was Israel's uh, greatest composer of popular folk songs, and Meir Hartzion, Israel's greatest commando, both figures, iconic symbols of labor Israel, both secularists. Many secularists went and joined this Gushemun march. A young Knesset member named Ehud Olmert was among those marching in late November into the West Bank. And when he was asked by a reporter uh, why he was here, his response was, this is the most apt Zionist response to the UN. So here we see the dynamic in, at play in which the international community singles out Israel for damnation, and the Israeli public pushes back by identifying with its most militant forces. The response of the government was fascinating. On all previous attempts that Gush Emonim had staged to illegally settle in the West Bank, the government had immediately called in the army and evacuated the settlers. And sometimes there was scuffling and some, some more violent encounters. This time the government hesitated. First of all, because it was facing a much larger group of people. And secondly, because there was a conference that was just being convened at that very moment in Jerusalem of the leaders of diaspora communities who had gathered to express solidarity with Israel in response to the UN Zionism Racism Resolution. And Rabin said at the time that given the fact that this is a moment when the diaspora has gathered to show solidarity with Israel, it would be unseemly for Israelis to be fighting Israelis while this conference was going on. But the conference ended a few days later, and the government still hesitated. Support within Israel was growing, and finally the government made a compromise in which it offered to take 30 or 40 families that Gush Emonim would select, move them onto an army base in Samaria, the northern West Bank, and then we would see what would happen. And this, of course, became the great psychological victory for Gush Emonim. They recently celebrated the 30th anniversary of, uh, of that victory. And even though the Likud came to power in 1977 and opened 
the, the gates to unlimited settlement. To this day, Gush Emunim relates to its Sebastia victory as the moment when the settlement movement became mainstream and essentially became unstoppable. And here I would unhesitatingly blame the mood that the UN created for encouraging the Israeli public to so wholeheartedly endorse Bush Emunim. The next transformative moment in this trajectory of Israel's relations with the international community comes in 1989. The fall of the Soviet Union, the collapse of the Soviet bloc, creates the opposite dynamic of the 1970s. Suddenly, nations that never had diplomatic relations with Israel, India, China, now approach Israel and begin, begin diplomatic ties. The collapse of the Soviet Union, which had been the world center for disseminating ideological anti-Zionism, now with its disappearance, so former Soviet bloc countries become some of the most enthusiastic pro-Israel nations in the world. And we're seeing that playing out today. Poland, the Czech Republic, these are among the most pro-Israel countries. The African countries that had broken diplomatic relations renew them. The Vatican, for the first time, establishes diplomatic ties with Israel. And this was a crucial psychological victory for Israelis. It reassured Israelis and many Jews that the Vatican had actually overcome the old theology of the wandering Jew, that the Jews needed to be in a position of, of, of eternal wandering, and that was the reason why the Vatican had not recognized Israel. Here the Vatican laid that suspicion to rest, and it helped deepen the growing ties between the Jewish people and the Catholic Church. The culminating positive moment in this transformation, again, at the UN. December 16, 1991, the UN reconvenes the General Assembly to rescind Zionism racism. The Israeli public responds in kind. The 1990s is the decade of, one could call it, an expansion of Israeli consciousness. Israelis suddenly discover the world and their place in it. They become, as many of you know, obsessive travelers to the most distant corners. Israelis go from feeling that the whole world is against us to the world is an extension of our being. Israelis become citizens of the world. The language of Israelis begins to reflect this transformation as well. The ugly word goy begins to disappear from the vocabulary of young Israelis, certainly young secular Israelis, and becomes confined more or less to the Orthodox community. The Holocaust begins to disappear from Israeli political discourse as a point of reference to the conflict with the Arab world. The kind of Holocaust rhetoric that Menachem Begin would routinely invoke in the 1980s becomes almost, almost uh, non-existent except for the far right. And no one captures this mood better than Yitzhak Rabin in his second term as Prime Minister. In his inaugural address to the Knesset in 1992, Rabin says the following, No longer is it true that the world is against us. We must overcome the sense of isolation that has held us in its thrall for almost half a century. We must join in the international movement for peace, reconciliation, and cooperation that is spreading over the entire globe these days lest we be the last to remain all alone in the station. Several months later, Rabin initiates the secret talks. Rabin in Paris initiate the secret talks with the PLO. Now, it's usually assumed, even by many Israelis, 
that the international community began to open up to Israel only once we entered into negotiations with the PLO. In fact, the opposite is the case. It was only after the international community rescinded Zionism resolution, the UN Zionism racism resolution, only after embassies began opening in Tel Aviv on an almost weekly basis that Israelis felt safe enough, they felt that they could trust the international community to the point where they could begin testing the waters for a Middle East peace process. This is the relationship that I think eludes much of the international community. Now, the optimism, of course, ended in the year 2000. The 1970s returned with vengeance, if anything, on a more global scale today than we experienced then. And the outrage that is being directed against Israel today is, if anything, met with contempt and even greater outrage among Israelis. Israel became, in the year 2000, first at Camp David in July 2000, then when Israel accepted the Clinton proposals in December 2000, Israel became the first country in history to voluntarily offer shared sovereignty over its capital city. Israel accepted the international community's demands over the last 40 years that it legitimized Yasser Arafat, negotiated peace with him, created a Palestinian state. At precisely the moment when the Palestinian national movement won its argument with Israel, which was in the year 2000, the Palestinian national movement changed the terms of the conflict and shifted, in effect, to jihadist war. So that the conflict today is not about creating a Palestinian state. If it were, there would have been a Palestinian state created nine years ago. The conflict today is a holy war directed against the existence of Israel. This is a war that continually shifts from front to front. Suicide bombings in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv, missile attacks from Hezbollah, Qassam rockets from Hamas, threats from Iran. It is essentially one war, Israel's longest war, that we have been fighting for nine years with no end in sight. And this is the war, Israel's war against jihadism. For that war, for the international community to miss the change in the conflict, the double change, that on the one hand Israel accepted the premise of a Palestinian state, and on the other hand the Palestinian leadership then went ahead and changed the nature of the conflict. For the international community to continue to, re to react to Israel and the occupation as if this were the first intifada of the late 1980s has only deepened the sense of revulsion among Israelis and especially among the younger generation. My generation fought, served in Gaza. I served in Gaza during the first intifada. And for me and for my friends, that was a profoundly disorienting experience. We came out of the First Intifada, many of us, feeling deep ambivalence and guilt about the occupation and feeling that the onus was largely on Israel as the stronger party to reach out to the Palestinians. My son, who just fought in Gaza, for him and his friends, there is absolutely no ambivalence. They are the generation that came after Camp David and the Clinton proposals, the generation that saw Israel's offer for peace being met with five years of suicide bombings, the generation that saw Israel unilaterally withdraw from Gaza only to be met with three years of daily rocket attacks on Israeli towns. And for this generation, as we saw recently in Gaza, there is, if anything, rage and, and no sense at all of ambivalence. I would, I would characterize the war in Gaza as our most personal or intimate 
I, I can't recall another war in Israel where soldiers went into battle with such a deep sense of anger as our kids went in this time. And the positive, the positive effect of that is very high motivation. Israeli soldiers fought with greater motivation this time than in any war since Yom Kippur 1973. The negative side, of course, are the expressions of rage and even hatred that emerged in Gaza, the ugly graffiti that was left behind by some Israeli soldiers, the t-shirts that some of you may have read about that some Israeli units produced with very ugly images. So that the pattern deepens. Israeli rage confirming the worst accusations, seeming to confirm the worst accusations of the international community, international isolation deepening, and Israeli attitudes further hardening. Now the isolation and demonization of Israel also has profound religious consequences. Secular Zionism was the most successful Jewish revolt against the theology of chosenness, I would argue, in the history of the Jewish people. Successful because this was not an assimilationist movement, this was a legitimate Jewish ideology coming from within the identified Jewish community and as a direct challenge to the notion of Jewish chosenness. Even classical reform Judaism did not abandon the notion of chosenness. But Zionist, secular Zionism took as one of its main ideological missions to free the Jews, as secular Zionists would have once put it, from this trap of chosenness, where we, are, where we see ourselves as being chosen by God, and that only deepens anti-Semitism. And that was certainly one of the ways in which secular Zionists critiqued the nature of anti-Semitism. It's chosen as provoking, encouraging anti-Semitism. Secular Zionism placed two goals for itself. The first was to return the Jewish people to the land of Israel. The second was to return the Jews to the international community. Or, as they once would have put it in secular Zionist circles, to transform the Jews into a nation among nations. The most compelling theoretician of the secular Zionist critique of anti-Semitism that I know of was Dr. Leon Pinsker, who wrote in the mid-19th century, before the emergence of political Zionism, and wrote a famous essay on the, what he called the anti-Semitism of the ghosts. Dr. Pinsker asked, why are Jews so universally reviled? And his response was that Jews are a disembodied nation that is haunting humanity and that is invoking humanity's fear of ghosts. Only by restoring their collective physical existence, only by re-embodying the Jews, would humanity stop imposing its dark fantasies on the Jews. Now let me read just for a moment Pinsker's words. The ghost-like apparition of a living corpse of a people without unity or organization, without land or other bonds of unity, no longer alive and yet walking among the living, this spectral form without precedence in history, unlike anything that preceded or followed it, could but strangely affect the imagination of the nation. And if the fear of ghosts is something inborn and has a certain justification in the psychic life of mankind, why be surprised at the effect produced by this dead but still living nation? Why be surprised? Imagine how surprised Pinsker would be that the re-embodied nation of Israel was what was drawing the renewal, the resurrection, of the anti-Semitism of symbols. That it was precisely in moving the Jewish people from their condition of being disembodied ghosts into being a nation like all other nations that would so outrage much of the international community. 
In the UN, the only country that has no regional affiliation, that is the wanderer among nations, is the state of Israel. More human rights resolutions are directed against Israel in the UN than against all other countries combined. Dr. Pinsker, I believe, would also be perplexed by the fact that Israel's critics celebrate the moral authenticity of the pre-Jewish state <coughs> ghost and accuse the re-embodied physical concrete Jewish state of betraying the highest values of the old Jewish ghost. Much as the church celebrated the Jews of biblical times, but accused the actual Jews who lived among them in medieval times of betraying the biblical values. Israel is under attack today because it is acting like a normal country. It is acting the way any other country would act in its place, and that is precisely why it is being demonized. So that we have what I would argue is a theological challenge to secular Zionism. The first group to understand this already in the 1970s were the ultra-Orthodox Jews. They immediately understood that the isolation of Israel, and especially the Zionism with racism resolution, was an unimagined gift to ultra-Orthodoxy. Ultra-Orthodoxy was the last holdout within the Jewish people against Zionism. It opposed Zionism precisely because Zionism tried to create, to transform the Jews into a nation among nations, and now that became impossible. And the argument that ultra-Orthodox rabbis have used ever since the 1970s is that it is absurd for the Jews to imagine that they could ever be a nation among nations. My friend Jonathan Rosenblum, some of you may know the name, he, is, he has emerged as one of Israel's leading defenders of ultra-Orthodoxy. He writes for the Jerusalem Post. He is also, incidentally, a graduate of Yale Law School and a convert to ultra-Orthodoxy wrote what I think is one of the most compelling arguments against secular Zionism in a column in the Post in 2007. And he called it, Embrace the Abnormal. And here is Jonathan's words. It is time to embrace our abnormal existence. The enduring, irrational, and protean nature of the hatred directed at us in all generations and all places is the greatest proof that we have been singled out for a unique mission. Rather than depressing us, we should view the rapid metamorphosis of anti-Zionism into the same old Jew hatred as one of the clearest proofs of our chosenness, and incidentally, of the world's unconscious recognition of that fact. Not by accident does the UN Human Rights Commission occupy itself with no subject other than Israel, or every European paper seemingly devote two or three articles a day to Israel. Now, beyond the ultra-Orthodox community, the realization has gradually settled in that secular Zionism's goal of restoring the Jews to the international community is failing. Here is another columnist, secular, writing in a local Jerusalem newspaper, Kol Hazman, at the height of the suicide bombings in the early 2000s. The suspicion slips into the heart that maybe the ultra-Orthodox were right when they warned that a sovereign state for Jews would annoy the nations and bring annihilation on the remnant of the Jewish people. The state of Israel, which was intended to give the Jews an entry ticket into the family of nations, did not deliver the goods. We're still being judged by separate standards. There is still no proportion between our actions and the responses around the world. It was nice to feel like everyone else for a while, but that seems to be over. Now when she says it was nice to feel like everyone else for a while, she's speaking, of course, of the 1990s. Israel today 
is in the grips of an internal struggle, both politically and religiously, in terms of our future and our future place in the international community. This is a struggle that I would characterize as being fought between the sensibility of the 1970s and the sensibility of the 1990s. And here, I believe the international community has a crucial role to play. And the more that Israel is isolated, the more that the decade of the 1970s and the sensibility represented by the old Gushevoni movement will increasingly prevail. I believe that most Israelis, even now, very much want to remain citizens of the world. Israel sees itself as being an essential part of humanity. It is still resisting ghettoization, but we are at a very delicate moment. And my hope is that the more forums like this can raise these issues, the more we can push back to the re-ghettoization of Israel that is proceeding all over the world, and especially on campuses, then the more we'll be able to ensure that Israel does not become a country that we don't want it to be, but remains the kind of country that we can be proud of. Thank you. situation where the international community, the academic community, the human rights community seems to be either blind or unwilling to listen. Is it a case of anti-Semitism? Is it ignorance? Why are people who have vested interests in fighting jihad not getting it? And not just the Jewish community, but women's groups, gay groups, religious, religious minorities, people who believe in democracy and citizenship. Why are they not getting it? I, I think that we're, we're seeing very responses here. And, and I, 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 once asked, I once asked the, um, the French Jewish philosopher Alain Finkelkraut, who has emerged, someone from the left, and who has emerged as one of uh, Israel's leading defenders in France. And I asked him, how is it that French anti-Israel intellectuals don't pause and, and ask themselves that once again, the Jews are playing the role of symbols of evil. And how is it that European intellectuals don't at least pause for a moment before wholeheartedly embracing the anti-Semitism of symbols in its newest form? And his response was that they are getting their legitimacy from anti-Zionist Jews. And so I think that what has changed in our time is the prominent role being played increasingly, and I think we're going to see more of this in the coming months, by Jews who are breaking ranks, supposedly, uh, and, and presenting themselves as supposed dissidents, courageous dissidents, uh, when in fact, in the culture that they, that they live in, uh, that is a, very, is a very conventional response. So it is, I, I, I don't, I would not underestimate the role that anti-Zionist Jews are playing in, uh, in poisoning the waters now. Cynthia Ozick recently made a very important comparison to the current <coughs> anti-Zionist Jews with, the, with converts, to, Jewish converts to Christianity in the Middle Ages who, who revealed the dark secrets of the Talmud to the church and, and oversaw the burning of the Talmud in Paris and Barcelona and other cities. And, and I, I think that the comparison is really worth pursuing. 
So that's one piece of it. And are, are the Jews who are anti-Zionist, are they anti-Semitic? These are, these are questions that we really need to explore. We need to explore it seriously, not just with, with our emotional reflexes. In terms of, uh, of the international community, again, we're looking at, 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 at many different levels. There is, there is a response to, um, I would say, a, 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 a kind of unknowing, unknowing support for anti-Semitism, which, which is not at all deliberate. And then there, there unquestionably are, uh, are darker forces that are being unleashed. Uh, but it, to, to my mind, the, uh, the symbol, the, the, the most telling moment was a cartoon that appeared in La Stampa in uh, 2004, 2005, you know, you know what I mean. This was a, um, th there was a siege, the Israeli army uh, was, uh, had placed the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem under siege. There was a, a, a group of Palestinian gunmen who were holed up there and La Stampa, an Italian newspaper, came out with a cartoon that showed the baby Jesus Confronting, he's confronting an Israeli tank and saying, oh no, they're coming to kill me again. So that, I think, is, is not at all innocent. And one of the aspects of this new form of anti, of this new form of the anti-Semitism of symbols is to attribute to the Jewish state all of the old negative attributes attributed to the Jews. The Jews are aggressive, the Jews are clannish, Jews only care about themselves. Uh, those, those are traits that readily translate into the anti-Zionist sensibility. So, Professor Landis from Boston. Uh, actually, I'd like to follow up on this point in two ways. One, um, Benny Morris just wrote to 1948, and one of the discoveries that uh, came to him as he was researching the book was that 48 was a GI. In other words, this has been a jihad all along, and they won a kind of uh, what the intelligence forces would call a cognitive war against us by convincing us that this really was about Palestinian nationalism. So that's one point. Second point, to go back to the Middle Ages, um, and to get at this issue of Jewish self-criticism, um, certainly one strong argument for the anti-Semitism of the Christians in the Middle Ages was essentially a moral one. In other words, the Jews set a standard, a moral standard, that feudal Europe was completely incapable of matching. Um, and as a result, in a sense, the, 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 the targeting of Jews was a way of targeting people who, in some way, made you feel morally inferior. And I think that that's what's happening again. And one of the things, and uh, you know, I, I don't know quite how to interpret your final remarks about Israel becoming a country that we're not proud of. Um, but one of the things about self-critical Israelis is that they represent a level of self-criticism that, in fact, with very few exceptions, no other culture has ever achieved or will ever achieve. So that I would argue that on some level, we're driving the world crazy with the incredibly high moral standards to which we hold ourselves. Well, I am, I'm, I'm, very, I'm very uncomfortable with um, the kind of uh, defense of Israel that was recently articulated by the uh, IDF chief of staff, Gabi Ashkenazi, when he said, we're the most moral army in the world. Uh, armies are not inherently moral institutions. They're not created to, to represent uh, ethics. And I don't know other armies, I don't know the Swiss army, I don't know the German army, I don't know whether other armies are more moral than we are or less moral. As a historian, I can assure you that Israel's behavior sets the standard. Take Janine, for example. Well, it sets the standard that no army, including the American, which is pretty good, has ever come close to matching. Okay. The, the Janine standard is no longer the standard of the IDF. And in Gaza, in, in this last war, the decision was made, and I think legitimately so, to employ massive firepower in urban areas, which we did not do in Janine in 2002, 
and that's why we lost 26 soldiers. And that's why this time we had more casualties from friendly fire than from, uh, than from Hamas. So that was a decision that was made. Now, I think that any other army in our place would make that decision. But that does not make us the most moral army. It makes us a normal army. Nevertheless, we are being singled out and demonized for, for applying the level of firepower that the United States applied in, uh, in Iraq, in, in urban areas as well. So, okay, well, well, you know, I, I again, I, I, you know, Richard, I'm, I'm, I'm really uneasy about this line of defense, and uh, I, I think that it, it fits into a pattern which, this, as a Zionist, I, I, I have to resist. And I very much believe in the secular Zionist assault on chosenness, which is that we don't have to be the best and in, in order to counter those who accuse us of being the worst. We need to free ourselves from this dynamic of considering ourselves the best and others considering us the worst. So, it's a long discussion. I have a side comment about Rabbi Ashkenazi, a comment about being moral. The most, the most moral. But I don't know any army that called up citizens in a building on the phone, tell them, within a few minutes, we're going to bomb. I have, believe me, the Americans have not done it in Iraq, have not done it in Vietnam. This is really unparalleled. And no one is talking about it. Tell me any other, any other argument that done this. The point remains, though, that when we employ massive firepower, which we did in urban areas, risking large numbers of civilian casualties, which we had to do. That is behaving like other armies. And I'm not apologetic for it. And I don't think that we need, again, I don't think that we need to be the most, or the best, or the chosen, in order to be simply a people that is in an impossible situation and that's trying to do its best. socialism uh, was really more of an expression, uh, a secularized expression of deep religious and even messianic longings that the secular Zionists still held, or at least the, the, the left, the, the secular Zionist left. The secular Zionist right uh, was uh, unabashedly nationalist, the revisionist Zionists, 
Uh, and their relationship to, to religion was more uh, instrumentalist. They, they used religion, uh, religion was an expression of, of nation for, for, the, for the secular right. Uh, in terms of uh, where is Israel is going, I prefer not to, to deal with your specific question of, of the future of the left. Uh, the left, just, I, I, I think that so long as the Israeli left ties itself to, to a, an unworkable uh, and messianic peace process, it's going to continue to be marginalized. But more, more broadly, I do not at all think that Israeli society is fated, or as you put it, doomed, to, uh, to be moving ever more rightward, uh, both religiously and politically. Uh, there are very interesting and complex movements in Israel, spiritual movements, that are, are emerging that I think indicate a, um, an, a, a, an assertion of the universal in Judaism. We're seeing it in Israeli music, Israeli popular music, we're seeing it in the, the kids who, come, who go to India, there are now hundreds of thousands of these kids who come back with a very strong sense of, of universal spirituality. So leaving the politics aside, uh, the, the, the fundamentalist religious rise is not a foregone conclusion. Um, so, uh, with regards to the conflict with uh, the Arab world and Islam, um, it seems that in the last, I guess, eight years of time, there's been a huge spike in um, anti Islam movements around the last few years. Um, and I'm curious as to what do you think the effect of a strong um, anti Arab, uh, anti Muslim It's an interesting question. I haven't really thought about it in the way that you've, that you've raised. And what, what does occur to me is that the, the Arabs and the Jews uh, should not be engaged in an effort to delegitimize each other in the West. Uh, sometimes it seems as if we're trying to convince the West that the other uh, should, be, should be beyond the pale. And, and um, there is in the West a long history of, um, let's say, uh, hatred or, 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 or fear, certainly uh, toward the Jews and also toward, toward Muslims. And I don't see that as encouraging that, as encouraging anti-Muslim sentiment as being in our long-term interest. Uh, Yehuda Pearl, who was the father of Daniel Pearl, uh, put it in a, in a very interesting way. He said that Muslims and, and Jews, and he, by the way, after, after Daniel was, was murdered, uh, his response was to become deeply involved in Muslim-Jewish dialogue and to start explaining Zionism to Muslims. And his, his vision is that Muslims will grant the Jews legitimacy, or Israel legitimacy, in the East, and the Jews will grant Muslims legitimacy in the West because the Jews preceded Muslim immigrants and, and of course, have successfully been successfully absorbed into Western society. So that rather than continuing to try to delegitimize each other, we have the possibility of legitimizing each other in parts of the world where our legitimacy is under attack. That's his vision, and, and obviously this is a kind of messianic vision. But nevertheless, it, it, it's, it's one of the personally resonates. Um, Yossi, I wanted to return to the prominent role of anti-Zionist Jews. Um, I've noticed while reporting in Europe that there's been a proliferation of anti-Zionist Jews who are present in the European press. Um, 15, 20 years ago, it was Eric Fried in London, or 20 years ago, who was, who was blasting Israel and, and attempting to keep them dealing delegitimizing Israel. Um, what's your explanation for this, this um, proliferation of anti-Zionist Jews and um, both in Europe and also out in North America and also the role of many Israelis who are, who are when they arrive in Europe, many of them, in my opinion, don't realize the context. They're giving interviews 
right. and and how that's playing out in terms of this whole this notion of uh, um, anti-Semitic anti-Zionism. Well, there is a less charitable explanation and a more charitable explanation. <laughs> the less char charitable is that they're embarrassed. They're simply embarrassed in, in the way that uh, the old German Jewish patricians were embarrassed by the Eastern European immigrants to the United States. Israel is a kind of, uh, I, I think of Israel in, in class terms. I think of uh, American Jewry as being middle to upper class, and Israel is a working class country. And the, the culture, the sensibility, and uh, part of this growing rift between the, the certainly American Jews and academia uh, and Israel is Israel's the embarrassing Jewish plumber. You know, we're, we're the we're the embarrassing cousin. We're a little we're a little uncouth. We're we're and uh, so there's there's a there's a, a need to distance yourself, much as the old German Jews distance themselves from Eastern European Jews. Uh, the more charitable uh, explanation, and I think this is worth considering, is that for many Jews in our generation, being having been victims is in some ways the heart of their Jewish identity. And that's what makes them proud of being Jews. And I say this without, without sarcasm. It, uh, the Holocaust is in a, sense, in a way, this is a, um, a the negative side of the emphasis on, 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 on the centrality of the Holocaust and Jewish identity. Because what's happened with Israel is that we Israel now threatens the, the legitimacy of that, of that identity. We now have victims of our own in this perception. And Israel is a threat to the core of their victim identity. That which, that which allows them to speak with empathy for other victims. That which allows them to not merely be lib white liberals, but to, to stand with a certain moral authority. Israel challenges that. And I, and I, and I think that that's, that's a, I think it's very painful for some serious committed Jews. Um, I have a question to the chosen left because it's really interesting. Uh, before coming to death, just uh, a very small remark to the IDF. I mean, there are just patterns of how many civilians are killed, how many soldiers, and Israel is actually in the top. The United States and Vietnam had one civilian, one soldier, the Israelis had 30 soldiers, one civilian. This time was less, but anyway, Israel is. The, the best in that case, there were just objectively. But to chosen that, I think it's a very important thing. There are three other groups of people who said in history and in contact today, today that they are chosen people and that's the reason for them to be against the Jews. The Spaniards in the 16th century, they say, well, we start the Jews, there are no more Jews in Spain, and we are now chosen Catholics of Spain. The second group is for the Germans. And um, there's a lot of proofs in history that Germans want to be the, the chosen people, uh, chosen race actually. And today we are the chosen Muslims who are going back to Muhammad to say that well, all people who are coming from Muhammad are the chosen people. And those people who do not accept him and the first who didn't accept Muhammad himself are the Jews. So I think uh, the opposition against the chosenness is really important and uh, you have to take this into consideration. Yeah, I very much appreciate uh, the comment. And the, the model that comes to, to mind for me is, um, is Biblical Joseph, uh, who was beloved by his father Jacob and despised by his brothers. And that really, in some ways, is the dynamic that I think secular Zionists were trying to free the Jews from, the, the Joseph syndrome, beloved by the father and despised by the brothers. So thank you, thank you very much for that. Professor I wanted to um, raise a theological question because the theology is entirely. Uh, I've heard you say that it's one of the tragic ironies of the last generation that just as we were healing relations with the Christian world, some of the anti Jewish defamations, demonizations were by opponents seeping into Muslim circles and regimes with my comp and the protocols translated into Arabic on coffee tables. The question is, what, what's your sense of Christian solidarity with the Jewish people 
at this point when we need all the help we can get outside the evangelical super science right. And I, I'm picking up the latest, the latest fashla of the, the Vatican with Bishop Williamson and the severing of relations between the chief rabbi and, and Israel and the Vatican and whether it's different of the culture is still on is still a question. Who, whom can we count on when, uh, and I remember we were celebrating the visit of John Paul II in 2000 and how Christianity came out of the woodwork for, mo for many Israelis, some of the Christians were in. Where, what's the sense in Israel now of uh, the Christian world uh, in the face of Islamic customs? Well, first of all, I, I, um, I as you know, I don't share your, um, your unease with evangelical support for Israel. I'm very grateful for it. And I feel that uh, when, we are, when we are at war, and really an existential war, and the fact that we have tens of millions of people who are knocking on our door and, uh, and, and identify with the Jewish people and Israel, not necessarily because of the book of Revelations, but because of the book of Genesis. That's the quote that you hear from evangelicals more and more. Uh, I will bless those who bless thee and curse those who curse thee. That's the, the evangelicals that I know uh, will, will, will quote that verse far more readily than, than Revelations. So I, I'm, I'm grateful for it, I, I, and I, I think that the Jewish community needs to do a better job in appreciating our friends at this time. Uh, I, I certainly wish that we had more friends in the liberal Christian community, my own theology, more, is more comfortable with that community. But as, uh, as you know, the expression in Israel, the people that I can pray with are not necessarily the people I can vote with these days. <laughs> uh, in terms of, um, of the, um, the Catholic Church, my, my sense is that unlike some of the mainline Protestant churches, uh, the Catholic Church is, 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 is not inherently hostile to Israel. Uh, unlike the evangelicals, it's not predisposed to, to supporting Israel on spiritual grounds. But I think that, that the most important work that needs to be done is with the Catholic Church. Because there, it, it, the attitudes are open. Vatican II has created the ground for a potentially positive attitude toward Israel as well. And my hope is that we will stop picking, frankly, stupid fights with the Vatican, like Bishop Williamson, and let our friends in the church, whose moral sensibilities we should trust after 40 years of dialogue, quietly handle those kinds of issues. We need to focus our priorities on fighting the jihadist war. That is the existential threat. And all of the old agendas that we had in terms of, of other anti-Semitic anti issues, uh, anti-Semitism coming from uh, the far right, or, or, or to my mind, those are secondary issues, if they should be issues at all in the agenda. Uh, well, my feeling is that uh, it seems to me that the challenges that are presented for the GBC of the state of Israel are enhanced by the sound silence in that challenge from the Jewish <coughs> Israeli I'm not aware of one article that questioned the legitimacy of the Arabs to that place of peace of miserable life. Uh, I am not aware of any statue of imitation of appearance, but I know that those Arabs that are there are the descendants of some Arab imperialism, which, by the way, is not another jihad at another time. So, where are, what are we, you said that we can be legitimized in the other party, but that's exactly what we should do, because if we see, if we are quiet about it, you are not just confirming what they're saying. Silence. I'll respond with silence to the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Harry, you're right. Harry, Harry thanks.
anti-Semitism is such that it really is not dependent on what Jews do or don't do, it's what Jews are. And more and more the criticism of Israel is about what it is as a Jewish state. Its being is what is offensive. And if you notice how the terms of the debate have shifted, when in the year 2000 uh, we accepted the international community's demands about 1967, suddenly it shifted back to 1948. And now we're arguing about, we're not arguing about 1967 anymore. The argument is about 1948. Mm -hmm. And that's an indication of how our being is, is, is what is ultimately offensive. You have to so that being said, what exactly is our role? And where, how should we be acting? Well, you know, I, I, I do take in the end the Israeli attitude that we need to do what we need to do. And Israel needs to defend itself. And there's just so much public relations that, uh, that, can, uh, that can counter the delegitimization. And at a certain point, I, I find myself as well saying, well, we're just going to have to learn to live with a certain amount of, uh, of chronic unpleasantness in the international community, because what's most important is for us to be able to defend ourselves. So, time is becoming an issue, so we have to collect a few questions, very brief questions, and uh, we have some brief, brief observation. I think two other motives for the public phenomenon of the anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic Jews, I think it's a desperate hunger to be accepted by the larger world of their community, in academe or wherever, as well as unconscious fear after millennia of persecution. I think the thought is, if I join in a pattern, when push comes to shove, I'll just stay The question, quickie question was about public relations. Because I don't think it's, one can defend oneself, but also, can't one do a better job of public relations like by saying, today so many rockets came out of Gaza, today so many, that, that it seems the public relations arm, there was a report of how small the public relations arm is in Israel, could be beefed up. Do you agree? Or? Yes, I do. <laughs> you posed a question, Yossi, towards the end of your talk about how we should deal with members of the Jewish community or Jews who are described as members of the Jewish community who partake in attacks on Israel and delegitimizing de Israel and attacking its successes. The, uh, I think Yehuda Pearl addressed it a little bit and said we should have the courage to attack them as anti-Semites anti in that they're doing the work of anti-Semites. My question has to do with uh, recent columns by Roger Cohen of the New York Times. Uh, the columns were very disturbing and very hard to answer, and I was wondering if you'd read any of his reporting from Iran and if you had any response to what he had written. Do you think that the continuing expansion of the settlement has a lot to do with the field of anti-Semitism? First, uh, the Roger Cohen columns. 
he, he is part of a, of a long tradition among Western journalists of, uh, of the, the naive dupe. <laughs> and uh, we, 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 saw, we saw that playing out in, in the 30s in, in Stalinist Russia. And, and uh, there's, there's something of that tradition that, that, that suffused his, his columns. Uh, they were appalling, quite, quite honestly. Uh, I, I heard that he had an interesting encounter. To his credit, he, he, he met with members of the uh, Persian Jewish community in LA who, as you can imagine, were, were simply beside themselves with these columns. And uh, I haven't seen uh, the YouTube of that, but I, I'm interested to, to follow him. Uh, the question of settlements. Uh, no, the, the short answer is no. And I, I think that, that settlements issue is very complicated. And most of the building, you know, before, before we get too technical, let's speak more, more theoretical. Uh, settlements build, the settlements, one can oppose the settlements, and, and, and one can oppose other Israeli policies, but there is an abyss between opposing a particular Israeli policy and demonizing Israel. Crossing that abyss makes one an anti-Semite. And it is, it is more than legitimate to criticize an Israeli, any Israeli policy. And we do it, as many of you know, chronically, and as Richard indicated, uh, obsessively. We criticize ourselves, and I'm personally glad we do it. But when you, when you make that leap from criticizing a policy to, to questioning the legitimacy of the right to exist, of Israel. No one questioned the right of Germany to exist in 1945. Germany continued to exist. Uh, Henry Morgenthau questioned the right of Germany to exist, the, 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 the American Treasury uh, Secretary. He said, in 1945, he said that Germany's soil should be plowed uh, with salt like Carthage. But that was a, a lone voice. No one seriously considered denying the right of Germany to exist. Even if Israel were guilty of all of the accusations that are routinely uh, cited, uh, it would still not make us Germany in 1945. And therefore, when you go beyond that and say Israel does not have a right to exist, I have no problem calling that person an anti-Semite. And this goes back to your point, and if that person happens to be of Jewish origin, then so be it. Given the fact that, that we're talking, we're, we're, we're now speaking in shorthand, because that's, that's really kind of a linguistic shorthand, the response to occupation is that Israel tried to end the occupation in 2000. And as one friend of mine, who's a, who's a former activist in Peace Now, put it, the Palestinians are not going to allow us to end the occupation. And that's, I think that really sums up what has happened in the last night. Thank you. 
proven to be unfounded. I'm thinking about Jewish liberal behavior here in America, vis-a-vis -vis George Bush, who perhaps is the most pro-Israel president ever, and Jewish liberal just vilification of what he was basically fighting a Jewish war in Iraq, and just a deafening Jewish silence vis-a-vis -vis Iran, and the community's yes. complete acquiescence and Hillary Clinton running around yesterday, old Richard Holbrook had a chance encounter with a deputy, deputy secretary of foreign affairs from Iran, and a Democrat, not the Democrat, the Islamic Republic of Iran. This our community's complete suicidal, silent behavior. And it's much more than anti-Zionist behavior. I think we're aiding and abetting our own demise. And how did we ever get to this? Well, I, I'm less harsh than you toward the um, American Jewish community uh, in the sense that, uh, especially on the Iranian issue, uh, the, uh, it's really the American Jewish community that, was, that has been in the, in the front line of, of the sanctions effort, uh, to its credit. And I would, in some ways, prefer to see more serious thought being placed in, in, in the Jewish community, and I, and I say this when I travel around the country, into thinking about how the jihadist war needs to change certain attitudes in the community. And just one, one very simple example, the appalling lack of security in Jewish institutions in this country, which terrifies me when I travel around. And if there's going to be an Israeli-Iranian confrontation, and my strong sense is that that is coming sometime in the next year, then American Jews really need to start thinking about several, several threats. One is the physical threat of terrorism. Second is, and this connects to what you were saying earlier, the assault on the legitimacy of American Jewish power. Now, I personally am very uncomfortable with analogies uh, to the 1930s and 40s. I don't think Israel is facing another Holocaust. I think we will be able to protect ourselves. We proved it in Gaza. I think we'll prove it if we have to in Iran as well. But in one sense, I do think the 30s are, are a useful analogy. And that is in terms of the growing assault to American Jewish political clout. The last time you had that assault was the 1930s. Then it was coming, of course, from the right, the America First Committee and Charles Lindbergh. Uh, now it's obviously coming from the left. My concern is that the Walt Mearsheimer line is going to grow. And American Jews are going to find themselves in, in, in a situation that they have not been in for many decades. I think you're strong enough to, to stand up to it. And I, do th and I do think there is backbone in this community, but it's not going to be an easy fight. Take a last question. Uh, this is, uh, I was wondering what was Israel's own part to do with this. I mean, thinking about the Rabin assassination, this didn't come out from the outside. This is within the Israeli right. Uh, occupation is true. I mean, it was wonderful to see the outside influence, particularly somebody, I, I served in that army. I'm Israeli, I told in Israel at that point. And I'm, I am really concerned. I am concerned about this government. If I see something here, that would sound like if I'm joining those terrorists, the, the enemy, where do you position that? But in your narrative, I didn't hear too much about the Israel's own responsibility. If we are not children, we still have to take responsibility for our own internal problems, such as somebody like uh, the Urban Assassinator, who's now granted more and more privileges as he's sitting in jail. Well, let's, let's focus on the, the issue you raised about, about occupation. And that really brings me back to what I said earlier which is that, you know, in the 1980s, when, when I served, in, and I was in a Gaza-based unit, and I felt very much what you're expressing now, but these are not the 1980s. This isn't the first Intifada. Something has changed since then. And Israel really made the deal, or the offer, that we were expected to make. 
Well, you know, if, um, if there had been an agreement in 2000, you wouldn't have the settlements, you wouldn't have the security wall, which is being built now literally outside of my window on the next hill, uh, which is a horrible thing to wake up to every morning. Uh, you wouldn't have the checkpoints, you wouldn't have uh, the, the occupation. So the question is, when you talk about responsibility, I agree with you, responsibility is crucial. And Israel did take responsibility after the first Intifada. We really tried. It's not to say we didn't make mistakes. We're a real country and not a, a collection of saints, as you may know. But nevertheless, at, the decisive, at every decisive moment in this conflict, 1947, 2000, we said yes, and the Palestinian leadership said no. Now that's really important to keep in mind. I'm also disturbed when I see Lieberman representing the state of Israel. I, 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 there's something in me that is re repulsed by that. Nevertheless, the point I was trying to make in my, in my talk was that there is a dynamic here and there are, we, yes, we are responsible, but the international community is responsible and most of all the Palestinian leadership is responsible. And, and if we talk about taking responsibility, the year 2000 is the moment when the Palestinian leadership should have been held accountable for their actions by the international community. And the fact that Palestinian leaders were largely given a pass, I think only encouraged the rejectionism and, and has put us exactly where, where we are today. So yes, let's take responsibility. Uh, Everyone has committed mistakes. This is a hundred year conflict, and a hundred year conflict doesn't persist without both sides consciously or inadvertently feeding it. But I really do believe that if there were a chance for peace, a strong majority of Israelis would say yes. And uh, so in the end, that's, that's, that's what helps me when I consider the, the moral implications of some of the acts that we have to do. Two quick announcements before I thank Yossi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Jewish Federation of Greater New Haven and Cindy Perry very much for putting on the reception and helping to organize this uh, beautiful evening. And I also want to thank Lauren Clark, the coordinator of ESA, who put, uh, put all of this together for us. So thank you both very much. And Yossi, thank you. And just as a, some information, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, we're having a, a, sem a conference where the researchers, the postdoctoral researchers and the graduate students uh, Avisa will be doing a full day conference on the different facets of contemporary anti Semitism and starting tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock in Davies Hall. So everybody's welcome, it's open to the public. Thank you, Thank you very much for coming. Yeah. He's very good. He's so good. <laughs>
I would have to say. And this summer he's been invited, um, as he's often invited in many places to speak at the Hanthropods. He'll be in New Zealand and in Australia and he'll be talking in national oratory about issues of anti-Semitism. So it is um, really a great pleasure for me to, um, to ask Charles to come forward. He will introduce the speaker, but I ask you on behalf of um, our community and all of the things that Charles does, to consider your own philanthropy and generosity to make sure that this program uh, continues and continues for a long time until, of course, there is no more anti-Semitism. <laughs> Thank you. So, Cindy, thank you very much. And uh, I moved actually from Jerusalem to New Haven. And I met Cindy uh, a few days after I arrived here. And I, 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 found... I waited that long. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I found the community actually very open and, uh, and kind. And it's been uh, an honor to be here. And it's an honor to be connected to the community. It's very important to remain connected to the community. Um, especially, I would argue, during these times. And as Cindy rightfully said, as Pesach is arriving, we have to face the new pharaohs and, uh, and be aware of what they're saying, to understand their language, to understand their agendas. And I think also the story of Pesach is also about renewal and freedom and redemption. But I think we really have to confront and face and understand the minds of our enemies and what they're doing and uh, what the agenda is. So, I urge you to, uh, to read some of the material that our, our illustrious guest uh, writes, to access material in our archive, to look at websites like memory.org, and to really understand what we're facing as a community. And I think, as many of you know, and many of you are aware, that these are very auspicious times and we need to understand and come together to support Israel and uh, to support the diaspora communities that uh, face significant threats. And I think there's nobody better than uh, Yossi Klein Alevi. It's really an honor to have him here today. The title of his talk tonight is The Political and Religious Consequences Among Israelis of the New Antisemitism. As many of you know, Yossi Klein Alevi is a senior fellow at the Adelson Institute for Strategic Studies at the Shalem Center in Jerusalem. He's the Israeli correspondent and contributing editor of the New Republic. He's written widely and speaks widely. He's a columnist for Jerusalem Post. He's a scholar um, throughout the world on Middle Eastern affairs and strategic issues, and obviously on the threats uh, that we face today in the contemporary context. It's really an honor to have you, and, and thank you for coming. Good evening, and thank you, Charles, and thank you for all you do and the profound way that you do it. If in the 1990s someone had told me that I would be delivering a lecture on anti Semitism in an institute devoted to studying contemporary forms of anti Semitism, I quite simply would not have believed. community to have the opportunity to hear from Yossi Klein Halevi. And that is thanks to the very extraordinary work of Charles Small and Yisa, the uh, Yale Initiative for the Inter Interdisciplinary Study of Anti-Semitism. Let me make just a briefest introduction and um, my hope I won't be embarrassing Charles at all when I say that um, First of all, propitiously, um, this program is um, falls almost right before the holiday of Passover, and um, and although he has programs, my goodness, if any of you get his emails, um, you know the, it feels like every time we turn around, he has not only a program but an extraordinary program that we don't want to miss. So congratulations on that. But it occurred to me when Charles said, "Would I say a word?" That um, as we prepare for Passover. In fact, this whole story, the story of our liberation, the story um, in the month of Nisan of, of miracles, of liberation, and certainly of hope, um, actually takes uh, begins in the first uh, section of Exodus when we hear um, the Pharaoh actually um, 
saying what may be the first recorded um, comments about anti-Semitism. And, and that is that the Jews in Egypt, or the Israelites in Egypt, are uh, multiplying uh, like animals, that they are taking up of the space, they may perhaps be, and this will be reminiscent of things we've heard, they may be perhaps um, be a, a fifth column, who knows what um, arrangements they might find with other um, other peoples. They should have had Yisa back then, I guess, to answer some of those questions. Um, I don't know, I've known Charles since 2001, and uh, it was before he, um, he had dreamt the dream, but he hadn't made it into reality of starting this, which is the first and the only and a permanent um, program based in America on the study of anti-Semitism. It is extraordinary. We are, of course, in New Haven, very lucky to be uh, living uh, with the uh, Yale University, the Urim, the Tumim uh, amongst us, but it is particularly um, a, a grateful thing for the New Haven Jewish community, as well as the Yale community, to have Charles in our midst. Charles is extraordinary, not only in the people that he has brought to this community and to Yale University, but also in his willingness to share the prodigious resource that is Gisa. And, um, and I personally am grateful to him both for his friendship and for his um, talent and for his willingness to be a strategic partner. And uh, that's extraordinary. Some of you, uh, because Charles by his nature is a pretty modest folk fellow, uh, you may not even be aware of his own academic credentials, which are extraordinary. He is, of course, a writer. He is a speaker. Um, he's just come back from a conference in Berlin um, in which he's talked about Israel, Hezbollah, Hamas, and Holocaust denial in um, the world. And, uh, and he will be at Durban, too. Um, and we would expect him to be at Durban, too, because we need to hear his voice at Durban, too. Um, and that is something which all of us should, um, look forward to hearing what well, its victory was too convincing and it unleashed the beginnings of this new form of the anti-semitism of symbols in the West the Israeli reaction to the growing condemnation especially in the UN and in diplomatic circles immediately after the six-day war was captured by the great Israeli satirist Ephraim Kishon in his article titled, Sorry We Won. And another symbol of that Israeli pushback to the condemnation against Israel following the victory was a, a cartoon that appeared in the Israeli press. And there was a famous symbol, a cartoon, a caricature known as Srulik, which is an endearment for the word Israel, Israel, who represented this, the embattled and spunky old Israel of pre-67. And the cartoon that showed Srulik just before the Six-Day War depicted Arab tanks surrounding this one little guy with a kova tenda, the old kibbutz floppy hat, and all the turrets are pointed at him and he's standing there defiant. The post-67 image of Srulik showed him again being surrounded by hostile figures, except this time they were diplomats pointing their finger at him. So that was the beginning of the psychological shift in terms of Israel's relations with the international community, in terms of beginning to realize that we have a problem. It did not get acute until the 1973 Yom Kippur War, the oil boycott which galvanized in the Arab world and put pressure especially on the third world, African countries for example, under the economic pressure of the Arab world, began one by one to break off diplomatic relations with Israel, and there was a growing mood in the state of Israel of siege. So that Israelis in the immediate aftermath of the Yom Kippur War, which had been the most devastating war that Israel had fought since 1948, the mood was really of a combined double siege. On the one hand, the sense of augmented Arab military power and, uh, and economic power, and on the other hand, of growing diplomatic siege against the Jewish state.
When Arafat was invited to the UN in 1974 to deliver his speech, don't forget this was the Arafat who did not even bother in those years to pay lip service, did not even pretend that he was recognizing the legitimacy of Israel. And he was invited to the UN and received a standing ovation. And the response within the Israeli public was that the legitimacy or the right of Israel to exist was being rescinded by the international community. The growing sense of isolation in Israel strengthened an emerging new right-wing movement known as Gush Emunim, the Blood of the Faithful, the religious messianic movement that promoted settlement. I was one of those Israelis in the 90s who believed that it was more or less over. It meaning the assault on Israel's legitimacy, the ghettoization of the Jewish state internationally, and I felt that those who were persisting in raising the issue of anti-Semitism were, quite frankly, being alarmist and were deflecting our attention from opportunities that were there to be, to be taken advantage of. And now, here we are, 2009, lecture on the new anti-Semitism. There are two forms of anti-Semitism. The first is unremarkable. It is the dislike or the hatred or the fear of the other. And in that sense, it is similar to the hatred or fear or dislike of any other. And here in the United States, when you track, for example, hate crimes, and that is interdenominational, non-discriminatory, under that rubric, you will have hate crimes against Muslims, Jews, other minority groups. And that represents the first kind of anti-Semitism. The second form of anti-Semitism is unique and potentially lethal. And that is what we may call the anti-Semitism of symbols. The anti-Semitism of symbols singles out the Jew as the representative of whatever a given society defines as its most detested quality or trait or moral offense. So, for example, under the old Christian theology, the Jew as Christ killer. Under medieval Islam, the Jew as murderer of prophets. Under Nazi Germany, the Jew as race polluter. Under the Soviet Union, the Jew as capitalist. And now, what is, to my mind, erroneously called the new anti-Semitism. Israel Zionism as the arch offender, the violator of what our society deems its highest value, human rights. Israel as colonialist, the Jew as the great poisoner of the well of human rights. And I say that the new anti-Semitism is, to my mind, an inaccurate term, because this is really just the latest incarnation of the old anti-Semitism of symbols, the old lethal anti-Semitism of symbols. Now, in my talk tonight, I'd like to explore the relationship between the growing demonization of Israel and Zionism and its impact on a hardening of Israeli political and also religious attitudes. The more isolated and demonized Israelis feel, the more that every Israeli act of war is turned into a war crime, the more right-wing Israelis turn both in their politics and in their religious attitudes. There are, of course, other factors at play, Arab terrorism, the hatred from within the Arab world, the isolation of Israel within the Middle East, the sense of betrayal that so many Israelis feel toward much of the Arab world in relation to peace agreements. Nevertheless, I would not minimize the impact 
of international attitudes, the growing judgmentalness against Israel, on the hardening of Israeli attitudes that we are witnessing today. And of course, the new government that just came into power yesterday, with Avigdor Lieberman as the face, external face of Israel, is an indication that we are increasingly on a collision course between the Israeli public and much of the international community. In fact, I would define it as a kind of poisonous cycle that we seem caught in, which is that the more Israelis feel under assault, under siege, the more Israeli attitudes harden, the more Israeli voters turn to politicians offering simplistic solutions like Avigdor Lieberman, and that in turn only seems to confirm the international judgment against Israel. Until 1967, the anti-Semitism of symbols directed against Zionism in Israel was almost completely confined to the Soviet Union and the Arab world. In Western Europe, attitudes were overwhelmingly pro-Israel. Cynics would say that that was a result of Holocaust guilt. I think that there was another factor at play, which was a widespread and genuine revulsion against the genocidal rhetoric that was routinely emerging from the Arab world. For example, in 1948, when Israel was, was founded, the then Secretary General of the Arab League, Azan Pasha, made a statement to the effect that the massacre that Arab armies were about to inflict on the Jews would, would make the massacres of Genghis Khan pale in comparison. And those, of course, were the years of the unbridled rhetoric of throwing the Jews into the sea. Ahmad Shukari, the founder of the PLO, the, the, the leader of the PLO before Arafat took over, uh, was a routine purveyor of the line of throwing the Jews into the sea. So that it was very difficult in the West to find sympathy for that kind of genocidal position. And I'll add parenthetically, we'll get to this point a bit later, that we are now, if anything, at a point in the conflict where genocidal rhetoric is even more pronounced against Israel. Yet, as we all know, much of the West has since developed a tolerance and ability to absorb the kind of genocidal rhetoric which in the 50s and 60s placed the Arab cause largely beyond the pale in the West. The transformative moment, of course, was the 1967 Six-Day War, when, again, if one wants to be cynical, one can say that Israel survived two waves.